Hello, today I'm talking about our Dynamics Final Project, which is a spinning top. This was accomplished by Sean O'Broy and myself, Colin Takeda. So for the project, we looked at a rotating top that was translationally fixed about its tip. The top was abstracted to be a cone and therefore was axisymmetric. The model assumed that there was no air resistance, no friction, and the top was one material. Looking at the derivation for our Euler's equations, so for the setup, we had a body frame that had V3 aligned with the top's axis of rotation, as seen in the figure to the left. Since there are two planes of symmetry, there is a diagonalized mass moment inertia matrix. And for the rotations, we used a 313 set of Euler angles. Starting with the right hand side of our Euler equations, we can find the angular velocity of the top uh, with respect to the inertial frame and then transformed to the body frame using our Euler angle rotation matrices. So in this general form, we have it as such uh, written out, we have a following form and then actually evaluating the matrix math, uh, we find the angular velocity to be the following. So now we have it in reference to our body frame. One simplification we can make is saying that psi is equal to zero. Since we only really care about the angular velocity and angular acceleration of psi, which is the rotations around the B3 axis, we can further simplify to get the following form for our angular velocity. So now we have the angular velocity in our body frame. Next, we want to find the angular acceleration in our body frame. Going forward, now looking at the angular acceleration of our top, we can take the first time derivative of angular velocity to get the following form. Similar to the move that we made before, we're going to assume that psi is equal to zero to simplify further to get the following. Now we have a definition for angular acceleration in the body frame, as well as angular velocity in the body frame, but we're still missing the principal mass moments of inertia to fully define the right-hand side of our Euler equations. We can plug in what we have so far into the right-hand side to get the following. While we're still missing the principal mass moments of inertia, we'll find them in the next step as we evaluate the left-hand side of our Euler equations. Now looking at the left-hand side of our Euler equations, we can see the sum of moments about our inertial frame. For our chosen geometry, we know that the R vector is defined as 3 fourths times the height in the B hat 3 direction. Therefore, we now have a definition of our sum of moments about the inertial frame but now needed in our body frame. Looking at the existing definitions of our axes of rotation, we know that I hat double prime is the exact same axis as I hat prime, which is perpendicular to K hat prime, and K hat prime is the same axis as K hat. I hat double prime is perpendicular to K hat double prime, and K hat double prime is again the same axis as B3 hat. So therefore, the direction of this cross product is going to be in the negative i hat double prime direction due to the right hand rule. We can now state for our cross product that the sum of moments is the following. So we're still missing one last rotation from i hat double prime to our B frame. So that last rotation is about psi. So using this rotation matrix, we can now define our full sum of moments for the left hand side. Um, in the body frame. Next, we're going to look at the mass moments of inertia of the top. Since we're using a cone as our geometry, we can find the existing equations for the mass moment of inertia about x, y, and z. Since, again, we have two planes of symmetry, we see that ix and iy are the exact same equation. Um, and plugging this into matrix form, we get the following for our definition of mass moment of inertia in reference to the center of mass. And then we can now find the mass moment of inertia in reference to our inertial frame, uh, which is evaluated to the following. We now have all the pieces for our Euler equations. So we have our principal mass moments of inertia, we have our angular acceleration, and we have our angular velocity all in the B frame. Plugging in our known values for the mass moments of inertia that we're missing earlier. Um, and further simplifying, we get the following equations for defining our top. We can then take these equations and put them in matrix form so that we can pass that into ODE45 for our MATLAB simulation. Looking at the simulation results for our model, we first did some initial conditions testing to see if it matched our expectations. So 
we first did a test where we set the angular velocity of outside to be zero so that there's no spin on the top and we expected it to just fully fall over. As you can see, this matches our intuition and the simulation also has a built-in stop vent to detect when the top falls over and hits the ground. Next, we are looking at some example simulation results. So to the right, you can see the initial conditions that we used. Next, we can see the X, Y, and Z positions over time of the top, as well as we can see the changes to the angular velocity of the top. In the B3 direction, we do see what looks like an increase in the overall angular velocity. However, this is an integration error when we look at the actual scale for that plot. Next, we wanted to validate our simulation by looking at the total energy. So to the left, you can see the equations that we used to define our potential energy as well as our kinetic energy. Then to the right, we can see that for our potential kinetic and total energy, that the total energy remains constant for the entire simulation, which is what we'd love to see. Next, we looked at what is the minimum RPM that you need to spin the top at to properly support itself and not fall over? Looking at the left plot, we can see a starting RPM of 3600, which aligns with what we saw for some gyroscopes online. Then to our right, we see a top with a starting velocity of 950, which is far more unstable, almost hitting the ground, and is almost at the minimum limit for the geometry of this given top. We can see for this given top that there's around a minimum of 850 RPM to properly support itself, but we further want to investigate for different geometries, how that changes the minimum RPM. So looking at this sweep of the radius and height of the top, we can see the different minimum RPMs for supporting the top. In the plot, we see that the minimum required RPM is positive related to the height and negative related to the radius. From a top design perspective, this suggests that you would want to design around maximizing the radius of your top while minimizing the height to achieve a low minimum RPM. We find that these suggestions for top design align with what we see for conventional tops. Lastly, I'm gonna talk through some simulation limitations and next steps if we were to take them. For our simulation, we have it stop when it hits the ground. However, this does limit some of the scope of what we can simulate. For instance, this gyroscope that you can see to the left, Additionally, if we were to redo the geometry, we would probably make it a more realistic representation similar to two cylinders where one is representing the rod and the other is representing the outside diameter of the top. Additionally, we would look at maybe changing some of the animations to make them more intuitive to understanding the system as you don't really have a way to understand the geometry at the moment. If we were to further explore this topic, we would look at comparing our simulation to an existing top or gyroscope. Um, and we'd like to see maybe an interesting extension where you add a kind of external force uh, at a point in the simulation. Thank you.